Well, morning. Welcome to Emmanuel Church. Morning. So, as you know, at the moment we've gone back to uh, pre-recording, premiere on YouTube. <laughs> Erica's going to, in a very happy way, <laughs> tell us what we're going to be doing this morning. Could you please do that happily? <laughs> Thank you, Ian. So our worship today is going to be a bit of a mixture of, uh, well, a mixture of people leading us. So uh, we're going to have Denise, Nigel, Joel, Rach and Leslie. So we're really blessed this morning uh, with, uh, with a mixture of kind of songs from them. Uh, we've also got a great uh, Wild Smith production animated story from Jeremy and Naomi Wild Smith. Um, our sermon today is... Um, our talk today is from Phil Trout, which uh, we're really looking forward to, and our interactive prayers are from the sh coming from the Shepherd family. So we so we've got a real uh, mixture of uh, people and zooming in different homes today, so which we're really looking forward to. Um, but before we do that, Ian, it's going to open in prayer, darling. Oh, that's great. Oh, yes, thank, thank you very you. much. In a smiley way. Okay, thank you. I'll do some social distance. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness to us. Lord, we thank you for your love and mercy for us. Lord, we thank you for your word when you are described as a loving father who runs to embrace his returning son. Lord, we thank you for your love for us. And Lord, we pray today as we gather together in our homes to worship you and hear your word read aloud, Lord, that you'd pour out your love upon us afresh today and fill us with your Holy Spirit, we ask, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, over to, to Denise, Nigel and Joel. Hello. Hey. Hello. Let's join together in singing about God's amazing love. Amazing love, how can it be that the my God should die for me?
Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Sunday morning. I've got another story I'd like to share with you this morning about a little person who did a really big thing, just like we are all at the moment, by staying home and staying in. This story takes place a long time ago, way, way back before putting pineapple on pizza was considered a bad idea. This story takes place in a land called Israel, quite a deserty place. And there's a young man called David. David is the smallest, youngest son of the smallest tri family of the smallest tribe of Israel. Today, David could be found out in the fields, tending his sheep and his trusty friend flower pots as usual. This was his job after all. And today was a fine day, so he was sat atop his favourite hill, playing his harp and worshipping God. His father walked up the hill to come and see him. David, oh David, come here son, I have need of you. Of course dad, what can I do for you? I miss your brothers awfully, they're off fighting with the army and I was wondering if you could take them some bread and cheese. You know, just a little treat to make them smile. Of course, Flowerpots and I will go right away. So David set off for the army camp. He walked for days and days and days. When David arrived at the camp, he walked around looking for his brothers, but then he heard a mighty cry. Roar! Come on out, you Israelite cowards! Who dare come and fight me? If you beat me, we will be your slaves. But if you puny weaklings lose to me, we shall, you shall do whatever we ask. Tie our shoes, make our beds, and even clean our toilets. David was very angry when he heard this, and he said to his brothers, Oi, guys, who does this giant of a man think he's talking to? Why have none of you gone to tell him to shut up? We are God's people. No one gets to talk to us like that. <laughs> you must be joking. David, do you see how big he is? If all of us saw each other's shoulders, we would be as tall as him. His spear is, is as thick as a cow's leg, and his sword is as heavy as one. How do you suppose we win? You bunch of cowards! Have you forgotten how great our God is? I'm off to see the king. Your majesty, you are the king, chosen by God. But... Why have you not told this giant of a man he's wrong? Tell him he can be quiet, go home, or you will have words with his mum. Look, young man, no one in our army is as strong as he is. They don't stand a chance. <sighs> Fine then. Looks like I'll have to fight him. And with God on my side, he doesn't stand a chance. You must be joking. You are tiny, just a boy. And he is a giant. You're not much bigger than his foot. I fought lions and tigers and bears. Oh my. And they're all bigger than me. But God is on my side. Mm, you make a good point. And now you have my armour and my trusty sword. Oh, uh, yes. Thank you, Your Majesty. It's all, it's all very nice. But I think it's just that the armour is a bit too heavy and... The sword is a bit long. Tell you what, I'll just take my slingshot. That's all I'll need. So David set off for the river. When he got there, he found five smooth stones, put them in his pouch and set off to find Goliath. Oi, you big bully! I'm giving you one chance to pack up and go home and tell your mum you've been bad or, in the name of my God, I will defeat you. <laughs> you must be joking. You are tiny. 
the only way you could win is if I trip over on you and bang my head. Even then, I would squish you. Well, I warned you. God, please help me. He's so big, but he's not as big as you. David picked out one of the stones from his pouch, placed it in his sling and swung it round and round his head. And when he let it go, and all of Goliath's friends ran around like headless chickens, afraid of David and the God of Israel. The end. Bye. See you next week. Sure. All right, here we go. In my wrestling and in my doubts, in my failures, you won't walk out. Your great love will lead me through. You are the peace in my troubled sea. Whoa, oh, you are the peace in my troubled sea. In the silence. Silence, you won't let go. In the questions, your truth will hold. Your great love will lead me through. You are the peace in my troubled sea. Oh, oh, you are the peace in my troubled sea. See this faithfulness, my lighthouse.
Dear Lord God, I thank you for Vista. I thank you for the community and I just pray that everybody supports each other. I thank you that people have been there to help each other and I pray that this continues, Lord. I pray for people going back to work. I pray that workplaces are safe and support each other and understand worries and anxieties and issues that people are facing. Can I just pray that we can... Um, work with each other and just really to help everyone get back to the new normal lord and i just pray that people ask for help when needed um, and that as a church community we can support um, each other whether it's you know home and, and virtual services or whether it's getting slowly back to seeing more and more people lord i thank you for the work you've done so far and just ask that you continue to Bless this uh, church and just bless this uh, community, Lord. Amen. Amen. I'll be doing next one, okay? Dear Lord Jesus, I pray that you look all after all of these children that are in the church. I pray that you remember them all. Remember them, Lord. And remember that they are special and please look after them well. Amen. Amen. Is this your prayer? Daddy's next. Okay. Dear Lord Jesus, we thank you for um, the blessings that have come uh, during this pan pandemic. We thank you for the opportunity to spend more time together as families. We thank you uh, for the work you've done in each, each and every one of our lives, Lord. We pray for those who have had a difficult time um, during the pandemic, Lord. We pray for those who've lost loved ones. We pray for those who've been ill. Um, we pray for those who've suffered um, economic problems uh, from work and um uh, for other reasons, Lord. We pray for um, the government and the uh, leaders. We pray for wisdom that they will make the right choices about how to manage um, public health and also the economy, Lord. Um, we pray for other countries where the pandemic seems to be getting worse and worse. We pray that you will put your hand on those countries, Lord, and give their leaders wisdom. Help the those who are in need, Lord, and those who are suffering. We pray for the churches across the world. We pray that they can be a real light and inspiration um, in their local communities, Lord, and share your love um, to those um, when they need it the most. And Lord, we thank you that we can still meet together, albeit virtually, um, as a community to worship you and to celebrate the wonderful life that you give, Lord. In Jesus' name, Amen. Mm -hmm. Alfred, did you say, who did you want to say thank you for? Alfie wanted to say thank you for Granny and Grandpa and, and his grandma and granddad. And so we just pray that grandparents and family and friends can really see and um, start to see loved ones, Lord. And it's just an easy decision of who to see, Lord, and that you are there to help in those interactions, Lord, that it's not an awkward or a hard thing, Lord, but actually I just pray that yeah, family and friends can just be there for each other. Amen. amen. Can you say amen? Amen. 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 Hi, I want to talk today about uh, new wineskins um, and the river of God. Uh, later, uh, for those that want um, a bit more, uh, I also want to talk about the tabernacle of David and the restoration of the tabernacle of David and how all these things are linking together in these days to show us the way forward, really, to, to explain what God is doing in these days and preparing us for what is to come. 
Uh, so we'll talk about new wineskins to start with. So Mark 2.22 says, no one uh, pours new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise the wine will burst the skins and both the wine and the wineskins will be ruined. No, they pour new wine into new wineskins. So the question is, well, what is what are those new wineskins? What does that look like? What does that mean? And this all kind of began from, you know, to be honest, a frustration uh, at the beginning of this pandemic. Um, I felt that there was no specific prophetic warning uh, for the church before the pandemic. I felt that um, all authority that the church may have was given over to government um, and we didn't have much say as to what was going on. Um, I couldn't see the healing power of God evident uh, in around us or in the hospitals or in the doctors or anything else like that. So yeah, we were just completely subject to this, this virus and it frustrated me immensely. You know, I was asking questions like, you know, where are the prophets? Where are the apostles? Where's the healing power of God? Where are the healing ministries? And what is God up to in these days? So it began a, a process really and um, <clears throat> you obviously... I really dug into God to understand you know, what it is he's doing in these times. And I, I was kind of uh, reminded of several prophecies that we received at ECB about river and the river of God uh, flowing from the platform out of the building into the streets. And this river carrying joy and healing and, and the vo a voice like many waters. And I, I, I'm, I'm thinking about it and thinking, well, actually, you know, this is a promise from God. Uh, we heard it so many times in so many different ways, you know, that, that you know, we, we should be laying hold of that and trying to understand what that means for us today. Um, and I was kind of reminded that we are the streams of living water. And we have left the building. We've been forced to leave the building. So we're no longer in the building. Uh, and perhaps this is the opportunity that we should be looking for uh, to, you know, to, to be um, streams of living water outside of the building. And I'm really convinced that actually that we are the river. We are the voice like many waters. I believe that the platform uh, for this river is public. So it's open air worship and physical acts of help. Um, you know, I, think, I don't think that this uh, worship is is should be restrained in 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 any way so it's very like david's um tent of worship where he you know was uh, worshiping with all his strength and all his might before the ark of the covenant when he was restoring that um and i you know i really believe that our worship should reveal the glory of god and his goodness so i just wanted to look at uh, revelation 22 1 when uh, this river of life is talked about initially uh, so the angel of the Lord showed me the river of life as clear as crystal flowing from the throne of God and the lamb down the middle of the great streets of the city. On each side of the river stood a tree of life bearing 12 crops of fruit, yielding its fruit in every month and the leaves of the tree for the healing of the nations. No longer there will be any curse, the throne of God. Uh, and the lamb will be in the city and his servants will serve him. They will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads. There will be no more night. They will not need the light of the lamp or the light of the sun for the Lord God will give them light and they shall reign forever and ever. So the, you know, the river of God is the water of life. It, it flows from the throne uh, out into the Dead Sea where it hits the Dead Sea, it brings life. And that refers to Ezekiel 47, which is the, the parallel to this. You know, the river of life was actually never designed to stay in the church. It was rather, it was, it was there to flow and to bring transformation to the world outside. And the throne of God um, is the place of worship. So, you know, it begins from our place of worship, which is the same as the pictures that we were seeing for ECB. So, you know, as we sit at his feet and uh, to praise him and, and music is released in the fullness of his presence and power, yeah, I believe that we're in. It will change us. It does change us. We know that that it, it gives us a, a hunger to do things for you know, the world outside. Matthew twenty five calls us to feed the hungry, uh, to bring drink for the thirsty, to entertain the stranger, to clothe the naked, to visit the sick and those in prison. 
And some of these are spiritual things, but also some of them are practical things. So there's something for everybody in this. There's, there's really no excuses for us. We need to be doing what we can. We need to be bringing our gifts to the river and using that in whatever way is appropriate for us as individuals. I think, you know, I think that there are lots of things happening uh, in our own streets and our own families and our uh, workplaces where we have uh, fantastic opportunities to do practical things as well as being salt and light, as well as bring, bringing a spiritual presence that is carried with us, um, that you can change the, the circumstances, can bring a different perspective. So just as in Acts 3, the, the result of worship and prayer is that we should hear God's heart for mission. We should, wor we should worship, you know, we should, and our hearts should be set free for a fire of Jesus and the things that he does. Jesus desires that the nations are his inheritance. And that, you know, that should become you know, our desire as well. So just referring to Ezekiel 47, uh, you know, we are invited to go deeper and we are invited to bring healing to the nations. So let me just read that. The man brought me back to the entrance of the temple and I saw water coming out from under the threshold of the temple towards the east, for the temple faced east. The water was coming down from under the south side of the temple, south of the altar. He then brought me out through the north gate and then me round the outside of the outer gate facing east and the water was trickling from the south side. As the man went eastward with a measuring line in his hand, he measured off a thousand cubits and then led me through the water that was ankle deep. He measured off another thousand cubits and led me through the water that was now knee deep. Then he measured off another thousand cubits and led me through the water that was up to the waist. He measured off another thousand, but now it was a river that I could not cross because the water had risen and was deep enough to swim in a river that no one could cross. He asked me, son of man, do you see this? Then he led me back to the bank of the river. When I arrived there, I saw a great number of trees on each side of the river. He said to me, this water flow flows through the eastern region and goes down to where it enters the Dead Sea. When it empties into the sea, the salty water there becomes fresh. Warms of living creatures will live wherever the river flows. There will be large numbers of fish because this water flows there and makes the salt water fresh. So where the river flows, everything will live. Fishermen will stand along the shore. The fish will be of many kinds, like the fish of the Mediterranean Sea. But the swamps and the marshes will not become fresh. They will be left for salt. Fruit trees of all kinds will grow on both banks of the river. Their leaves will not wither, nor their fruit fail. Every month they will bear fruit because the water from the sanctuary flows to them. Their fruit will serve for food and their leaves for healing. I think it's a fantastic picture of uh, you know, this river leaving the church from the throne and it getting deeper and deeper as we get further away from the, the, the throne room. I think that's a fantastic picture for where we're at and what is happening. Um, so just looking at this, you know, the, the, the deeper, the further from the throne, and God always wants to invite us deeper. We, you know, first have to rather near the throne of God, but by the time we're near deep, the river is trying, is beginning to get a hold of us. And by the time we're at shoulder height, the river has absolutely full control. You know, we should, we should be expecting this to happen. This is the place of encounter and immersion, presence and intimacy. This is where we should be heading. The world is hungry for a genuine touch of God and the manifestation of his presence. As we go deeper into the river, people will be drawn into their own encounters. Just, just as Joshua followed Moses as he dwelled with God in the tent of the meeting to, well, to dwell in his glory, we should be thinking of the same thing. You know, I believe that you know, a church that's been immersed in, in the river of life the way ours has, you know, we are a people who now walk in union and intimacy with Jesus Christ and I think that believers who hear, who hear God's walk, hear God's voice and then walk in obedience to his will are empowered by the Holy Spirit. And this is, you know, as the river flows, love and grace will increase. And the love of Jesus was made to be known. It wasn't made to be hidden. We were never made to be hidden in the building and worshipping in the building. You know, I think we've, you know, God intends to use this whole pandemic and being shut off 
from the building to, to push us out of the mist and literally bring us to a place where we are, you know, his hands and his feet, his voice, uh, his love, uh, his healing. So this river then reaches the lost, you know, where the, where the rivers have, all rivers have an outlet. And in this river of Ezekiel 47, there's no fish where the water comes out of the throne. But when the river of God hits the Dead Sea, it overflows with life. The Dead Sea is a picture of the world. So when uh, our river of life hits the Dead Sea, we should be expecting to see new life. The waters are healed wherever God's rivers go. And the purpose of God, the river should flow from us and out into the world around us. And that's our invitation to see the world that is dead in religion and dead, not realizing that the saving grace of Jesus Christ has come alive and that there is the love in the power of Jesus. They don't necessarily know these things yet. We need to show them. We need to be more open um, and uh, you know, reveal the truth to them. I believe that God is looking for a whole world to encounter his transforming presence. You know, we are the new tabernacle of the Holy Spirit. And it says so in 1 Corinthians 6, 19. You know, Christ in us is the hope of glory. That's from Colossians 1, 27. And from us flows the streams of living water. That comes from John 7, 38. All of these things um, combined together show us that we are the ones who are the river. We are the ones that bring the, the presence of God. We are the, the, the streams of living water, and we are the ones who have left the building. I think, uh, you know, in recent years, there's been a, a number of things that have uh, been brought to the church as suggestions for things that we could be doing. One was um, an evangelist who was given a tent, just kind of a more of a marquee. It didn't have any walls in it. And I was really struck by that. And I was thinking, well, that sounds like the tabernacle of David to me. And, you know, the tabernacle of David is promised to be restored uh, in, in the latter days. I'll come back to that later. You know, another a lady, a prophetic voice in the town, he had a vision for, for a store giving out prophetic words to people. You know, I think that there is a, you know, this, these two things in combination could be very powerful. And I think that, you know, we are coming into the days where open worship, open prophecy, open evangelism, open healing are all part of God's invitation to the for the church to join him on the streets of our town and to be proactive and to be active and to, to operate in the grace of Jesus, offering his, the fullness of his love. Uh, last week in the United States, I read a report of a, a meeting of about 5,000 people uh, who went to a worship, a Christian worship event on a beach. Uh, after an extended period of worship, there was a short altar call, and all 5,000 were baptized in the sea. There were so many people that um, the first that were being baptized had to turn around and baptize the ones behind them because there just wasn't, there wasn't space or time to, you know, for one or two individuals to be baptizing you know, each of them in turn. It was just a massive event, huge event. And I believe that this is the beginning of the new wineskin. I believe that this is how it should be. It's a church without walls. A few, a few nights ago, I had a dream. And uh, in this dream, the, the devil was bragging and trying to taunt God. And he was saying that uh, he had created the king of all viruses. Um, I don't know if you realize, but Corona means crown. So it is, a, you know, in effect, a king um, of viruses. You know, this, uh, and the, the devil was bragging and saying this virus has shut churches and stopped corporate prayer and, and corporate worship and made uh, God's church impotent. And he was kind of bragging and being you know, very unpleasant about the whole thing. But God just laughed and said, um, have I not said that the tabernacle of David will be restored in the last days? That comes from Amos 9, Amos 9, 12. And then he went on to say, my people will develop their inner prayer life in the true tra tabernacle of the Holy Spirit. My people have left the building, will become visible in worship and prayer. My people will become the new wineskins for the outpouring of my spirit on all flesh. And he went on to say, the tabernacle of King David trumps your King virus. My people are more than overcomers. 
and I was at that point I woke up and I was struck by two things first by the pure arrogance of the devil but more than that you have the absolute confidence of God who knew absolutely in advance that all of this was going to happen and he already has a plan and made provision for total victory for his people um, you know this dream followed several days where God was talking about past revivals uh, and and the recent prophecy of um, um, you know, rivers at uh, ECB. Some of you will know that some years ago I experienced a glimpse into what a true revival looks like. I mean, it only lasted a few days. It was in Houston, Texas, but it was a life-changing experience where the glory of God was so intense that all were convicted of sin. I mean, everybody in the building were convicted of sin. Um, people were coming into the building who were total uns unsaved, and they were being they were coming in because they were convicted of sin. Um, you know, I didn't intend to be uh, at this meeting. I happened to be in Houston, Texas. I shared with um, some guys I was on a leadership, a church leadership training scheme with, and uh, one of them was a, an outright prophet. And he had a, a strange experience and then just wrote down the name of this church and just said to me with two, you know, three words, don't miss it. So I was clearly... It was clearly ordained by God that I should be there. Uh, when I arrived in Houston, Texas, I knew it was a Sunday morning. I knew I had to go straight to the church. So I was just in, so impacted by the Holy Spirit. So a friend of mine and I both uh, drove straight to the church and um, you know, everything had already kicked off over there. But that was the first day that it happened. It was just a, a, you know, a crazy experience that um, you know, the outpouring of God's holiness was um, truly a fearful thing. And actually, this is something which um, is completely biblical. Um, you know, we always talk about, you know, God's love being, you know, the current revelation that we receive. And I think that's great and that's good. Um, and that's what I was born into. But in truth, um, God's holiness is the thing that really changes societies. And we can see that from past revivals. Uh, so uh, if we look at, um, for example, there were people on the on train going past Mariah Chapel, which is the seat of the Welsh Revival. Uh, there's about a mile away. I've actually been there. God led me to Mariah Chapel completely turn by turn. I didn't know where I was. Um, when I arrived there, it was um, you know, quite a revelation for me in lots of ways. Um, but I remember walking to the top of the hill, which is maybe half a mile from Mariah Chapel, and looking south, and you can see there the railway line. And I was recording the stories of people falling to their knees in repentance on the train you know, without a single word being said to them, no worship, no preach, no call to repentance, no nothing. They were just impacted by um, the, the sovereign manifest presence of God on the train uh, a mile away from Moriah Chapel where things were happening. In the same way, whole villages in the Hebridean revival came out onto the streets in the night just literally kneeling at the side of the road in repentance, uh, again, completely impacted by um, the sovereign presence of, of God, being so powerful, uh, revealing his holiness, uh, which is convicting them of their sin. Um, I always kind of uh, think about um, Moses asking to see God's glory. Uh, this is in Exodus 13, 18 to 22. Um, Moses asked to see God's glory and, glo and God replies uh, that he will allow all of his goodness to pass before him. Um, so there's a, a link between glory and goodness. And when he says all my goodness, I think that refers to his holiness. It's he's so good that he's holy. Um, in verse 22, it goes on. God says again, when my glory passes by, yet in, in verse 19, he says, when all my goodness passes before you. So that he uh, does make the equation between his glory and his goodness. Um, and it's such an extreme thing, you know, to experience. Um, and I have experienced it uh, personally, and it was uh, a life-changing experience. So, you know, I think that... Um, if, we, if we're thinking about uh, the tabernacle of David and the restoration of the tabernacle of David, um, then 
um, this is where the the glory of God is actually you know, made made plain. Uh, David's tabernacle had no sides. Uh, it was uh, a place of absolute worship, but the um, uh, the Ark of the Covenant with the, the two angels' wings and the, the blue flame, uh, which it was the glory of God, representing the glory of God, was totally visible from everybody outside. So it wasn't shut off um, and in the holies of holies, you know, as in Moses' days or you know, uh, after that when, uh, when it was built of stone. Um, so the, the whole experience um, of uh, the tabernacle of David is to be worshipping without walls. And here we are, we're outside the church. Uh, I believe that we're in a, in a place where we can uh, be worshipping on the streets, uh, tabernacle without, without sides, uh, and to see the glory of God being manifest. I believe we all need to prepare to receive a, a catch of fish far, than, far bigger than we'd ever imagined, uh, to, you know, to disciple many in the ways of God, to, you know, for, to train them to hear God for themselves and to facilitate the healing and restoration of God you know, for them, each one of them. And I think it's a fantastic opportunity that we've been uh, presented. I believe that God is literally kicking us out of the nest. I believe he's, he's turning everything for good for those that love him as he promises he will. And I think he has a plan. I understand now where his plan is. I don't feel frustrated in the same ways that I was, but I'm determined that we won't miss it. Um, so I, I would encourage you just to dig in in prayer, uh, to, uh, to seek God as to what he wants you to do uh, in, in your community. Uh, you know, if you are a musician or um, if you have you know, one of the more prophetic gifts, then to consider you know, what it is you could bring if we were to meet outside. There is a meeting coming outside the church in a few weeks. Uh, there are opportunities there to really, really see what God will do. Let's see. Let's see what happens. God bless you. So
So we hope you've really enjoyed the service with us today. Erica's going to tell us about the final blessing. So we're not actually going to say a blessing today, but we're going to have a blessing sung over us. As many of you know, uh, the song of a blessing has been one of those kind of songs that we all always remember this time uh, by. And lots of different churches and people across the world have recorded this song. So Rach Bowen has got some of the people in the church together, about 19 voices, I think, all together, uh, to sing the blessing. So she's going to put this together for us. So we thought it would be really great if we can uh, just uh, premiere it. Premiere, isn't it? Got it, got it, nailed it. So we're going to premiere it this morning uh, so you can uh, be blessed by it and you'll probably see some familiar faces as well. So... Over to you.
children. Come